so I've been on a journey for the past 8 months working on my game, Penumbra Tower. It's a grid movement roguelike similar to something like Crypt of the Necrodancer, where you play as this cute little frog guy fighting enemies as you ascend the infinitely scaling tower. And for a while now, I've been fighting an uphill battle. You see, combat in my game feels a little one-dimensional at the moment. You hit enemies enough times and eventually they die. And sure, I've added item stats and status effects to help expand the possibilities of this system, and in the last devlog, I even added placeable bombs to damage enemies and destroy the environment, but it's still not enough. So how am I solving this problem? Well right now, enemies have the upper hand when fighting the player. You see, every enemy in my game has a unique ability that it can use in combat. The pikeman can charge across the room, the spider can summon spiderlings to help it fight, the rat can have a little snack when it's feeling hungry, and so on. So what if I gave the player access to all of these abilities as well? As of this devlog, there are 9 enemies that can spawn, meaning 9 abilities that the player could potentially leverage as well. But before we talk about implementing abilities, we need to talk about another system first. I already mentioned it a second ago, but I added bombs in the last devlog, and in order to not run out of bombs, I needed to implement a pickup system, where on death enemies have a chance to drop a bomb for the player. But this is actually only part of it. Bombs were just the first piece of this puzzle, and I wanted to add more. So I jumped into Krita and made this mushroom sprite for enemies to drop. I think you can tell where this is going. And after adjusting the pickup dropper code, now enemies also have a chance to drop mushrooms on death as well, which when picked up will heal the player for a percentage of their total health. I also went ahead and made a small change to the way that bomb damage scales. Originally, I had it scaling with the enemies, which was about every 5 floors, but this made it feel inconsistent. So instead, I tied it directly to the player's damage. This doesn't really matter too much, it mainly gives the player more control over their bomb damage, as well as increasing the opportunities for future bomb-related items. Okay, so now that all the boring stuff is out of the way, let's talk about migrating the enemy abilities to the player. A couple of things need to happen here for each ability to work properly, but I'll go through that on an ability-to-ability -ability basis. Starting off with the easy abilities first, Eat Cheese, Mimic Pattern, and Enrage are fairly simple because they don't interact with anything outside of the unit using the ability. First, I needed to assign a button to a general use ability method that the player can use to activate whichever ability has been assigned to it. For the Eat Cheese ability, I pretty much didn't have to make almost any changes, so that's nice. Implementing the Enrage ability on the other hand was making me feel a little enraged if you know what I mean. Huh. This one actually wasn't that bad. The bad ones come later. The way the Enrage ability works is it doubles the unit's actions during its next turn. Now, I developed this in a way so that the enemies know to only activate Enrage on the last action of their turn, but for the player, I've made it so that activating Enrage will end the current turn, which leads to some strategic thinking for the player deciding if they want to end their turn early or wait until it's their last action to use Enrage. Now, I didn't need to make any changes to the Mimic ability either, but it ended up functioning a little different from what I originally intended. Just so this makes sense, I'm going to quickly explain the basics of enemy movement and attacks. Enemies can move one tile per action in any direction, but they also have attack patterns which dictate where and how far they can attack. The difference with the player is that this pattern is what controls the player's attack and movement. So when the player gets assigned a different pattern, it restricts or enhances, depending on how you look at it, both the player's attack and movement capabilities. This is one area which I'm very interested in what you guys think about this. It definitely opens up another aspect of the game in a way I wasn't really expecting. So the remaining abilities required a little more effort because they needed to be broken down into two steps. Step 1 being activating the ability and step 2 being aiming or selecting a target. Because of this, inside of the player controller I implemented a state machine to manage the behavior for each ability. For example, when the player activates the dig ability, the player transitions into a dig state where you can select which unoccupied tile you would like to dig to. Similarly, for the teleswap ability, you transition to a state where you select which unit, or obstacle, you would like to swap places with. This is a little more extensive than the enemy's version because enemies will only swap with the player. 
For the projectile ability, the player transitions into an aiming state. I put together these arrow sprites to indicate that the player can aim the projectile in 45 degree increments. I also needed to rewrite the projectile code, but I won't get into that because it's boring. But someone commented on a previous devlog saying that I should change the enemy's projectile into a feather or something. And well, I needed to create a separate prefab for the enemy projectile anyway, so I thought I might as well make a new sprite as well. The charge ability was a little bit of an issue. Okay, it was actually a huge issue. This took me so long to get working properly. I don't know what was going on with this, but there was a ton of bugs. I was about two seconds away from saying, all right, no more Penumbra Tower. But eventually I got everything wrapped up properly. I was also able to optimize the charge a little bit so it feels extra smooth now. And you can even dash straight into the exit door. We are on the last ability. This one was also kind of annoying. I didn't want the player to summon the same spiderlings that the spider was summoning, so I hopped into Krita once again and made a little tadpole for the player to summon. But the main bulk of the work for this ability was adapting the AI controller script to be hostile towards the closest enemy to the tadpole minions instead of the player. Oh, look at these cute little guys. Once the player summons some tadpoles, they will take an action when it's the player's turn, either moving towards an enemy or attacking. There are still a couple of tweaks I want to make to this script, but it's working well enough for me to move on for now. So now that the enemy abilities are compatible with the player, the next obvious step in development would be to give the player a way to find these abilities. Is what I would like to say, however, because this would mean working on something new, I started procrastinating and decided why not work on some items. This first one is actually a change to an existing item that's been a long time coming at this point. In order to better balance the draft of juice, I've changed its effect from granting an extra total action to increasing the chance of not spending an action. Now, if the player is exceptionally lucky, they could potentially chain together multiple bonus actions. Which, in my personal opinion, feels a lot better than what it originally did. So, one of my absolute favorite builds in any game with combat is Critical Strikes. It always feels so good to randomly do huge amounts of damage. And the new item, Bone Dice, can help me live that dream. Bone Dice increases the player's crit chance by 5%. Critical hits will deal 150% damage to targeted units. So, with the addition of mushrooms in the game, I started thinking, but what if there were more mushrooms? So, I added in these two new items, Fungus Troop and the Lost Lodestone, to increase the drop chance of mushrooms and bombs respectively. But something that I didn't want happening was the player picking up an infinite amount of bombs, especially with the change that I made to the bomb damage and the new drop chance items. So, I put a cap on the amount of bombs that the player can hold, starting at 3. But, if you manage to find a bomb bag, you can increase that amount by 3 for each stack of the item. But you know what really doesn't feel great? When items don't manually get picked up by the player, and then you have to walk all the way over there and you end up stepping on some spikes, like some sort of loser. Well, you don't have to worry about that if you have the Amber Attractor, which increases the pickup radius for all pickups. And finally, an actually useless item. I'm not even joking. Have you ever thought, man, I wish these dead enemies would turn into piles of bones when I kill them? Well, you don't have to worry, they can. If you're wondering why this item exists, I have some future ideas for some other obstacle-related items that will build off of this, but I won't be worrying about that this devlog. Enough about items though. Okay, so how does the player find these abilities? Well, this little frog guy will always start with the projectile ability. I think it just makes the most sense thematically, but if the player wanted to change their ability to another one, they would need to find this floor. This floor has a low chance of appearing. Here, the player will encounter a lost adventurer who will offer to teach the player a random ability. So obviously implementing a dialogue system and reworking the floor spawning code seems like a lot of work for simply swapping the player's abilities. And well, it was. But there is a reason. You see, this little pig is actually kind of a placeholder for now. My end goal for this is, instead of this pig appearing here, you would find a unique NPC for each ability. 
and once you find them, they would return to the entrance of the tower, where they will be available to play in a future run, similar to the Binding of Isaac, Enter the Gungeon, or Nuclear Throne. But that's a lot of work, and would require me to start working on a save system for the game, which I don't really want to think about right now. Other than that, I also made a couple UX changes here and there. I shuffled some things around, and previously I used to list out all of the stats on the left side of the screen, but with the addition of the new items, I changed it so that the stats only appear if they have been modified in some way, uh, because it was becoming way too overwhelming. And I mean, who wants to see a whole bunch of stats that are just zero anyways, right? If you've made it this far in the video, you must be at least somewhat interested in the game. So consider wishlisting Penumbra Tower on Steam. I really appreciate it, and I really need those wishlists. Anyways, that's all the updates I have for this one.